Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. I want to talk about this book, A Shiny by John Fossey. I don't think I've ever read uh, a book so short that causes so much damage and plays such havoc with my impressions of an author. So I've never read Fossey before. I'd avoided the septology because uh, my understanding is that uh, the sort of doppelganger writer characters throughout, or at least in the earlier parts of it, one of them is an alcoholic, and I, I just uh, reading about addicts is is long behind me. Um, I'm the child of an addict, albeit not uh, alcohol, and in my twenties I read an awful lot as I researched for a play of mine about um, an embryo addicted in utero to hard drugs. Um, I thought the, the Lost Weekend with Ray Milan was a great film, but by the time uh, Leaving Las Vegas came out with Nicolas Cage and Elizabeth Shue, it may or may not have been a great film, and it certainly had a great performance by Elizabeth Shue, but I had no, I mean, I did watch it, but it did nothing for me. I, I, I'm just done with stories of addiction. I've lived it vicariously, unfortunately. I've read and seen a lot about it, and it just no, I just can no longer derive certainly not pleasure and, and, and not really any sort of fresh information about it. So that's why I'd steered cleared of it, even though there are lots of booktubers uh, who I trust uh, and I like their taste and they absolutely rhapsodise to a person. I mean, there's not a single dissenter I've come across on booktube about the works of Foss. And let's face it, the guy won the Nobel Prize for writing for literature. Um, and that must say something because of all the prizes in a way it has a certain purity over the others and it's not a sort of um, game of manoeuvring by all the publishers trying to think which is their best chance of winning any literary prize and it's not even for one book it's for a body of work a career a lifetime of writing so obviously there's something to Jan Fosse um, so I thought maybe uh, wrongly that this short book which I think begins on page nine, no, page seven, and ends on page 44. So it's 37 pages, which I think we'd have to call a short story or a novella, certainly not a novel. I thought this would be a good way in because it, it's not part of the septology. It's it's completely separate character. And, I, you know, he has been presented to me by the rest of BookTube as a supreme stylist. So if he's a supreme stylist, that should show in this book. And um, I'm troubled, having read this, I'm deeply troubled. Now, the first thing to say is that, as far as I can tell, all of the septology has been translated by the same translator, who is Damien Searles, who translated this. So if there's an issue with him not being a supreme stylist, it's unlikely to be the work of... Uh, unlikely to be laid at the door of the translator, because... Translators don't really lose their mojo. I can't imagine translators losing their mojo in a way that authors can. Um, you know, translators get a finished script to translate, whereas authors might have a contractual obligation to produce a book by a certain date. I'm not saying that's the case here, but um, I don't think Damien Searles is the reason for why this book um, had the impact on me it did. OK, so let's talk about what the plot is first. Uh, a man in Norway is bored, doesn't know what to do with himself come the evening and decides he's going to go for an aimless drive and the only sort of uh, logic or direction he gives himself is that after every right turn he makes in the car he'll make a left turn and that he will alternate. And he ends up off uh, a main road and onto a track through a forest and eventually the car gets stuck in the forest, it starts snowing um, which sort of makes his car sort of even more stuck, as it were. And he has to decide what he's going to do. And he decides he's going to get out of the car and he's going to walk and seek help, even though he knows that, you know, this is such a remote part of the, the countryside that it's very, and it's night time, that it's very unlikely that he's going to find anyone. But, you know, better to try. He remembers that there were very few uh, houses back on the main road which he's left a long way behind him and the only cabin he's seen on the way in the forest was clearly abandoned that there would be no help to be had from there. So he's walking 
and he sees coming towards him this sort of shining pulse of light which is a sort of human size initially he mistakes it for another human being but as it comes closer he sees it's just this sort of light and energy and when this this uh, pulsation has reached him they're able to converse albeit the light or the shining is reluctant to answer several of his questions but they do have a sort of stilted conversation of sort of sorts and they start walking off together and then the shining light disappears and the next sort of apparition as it were are his parents uh, he sees coming towards him now any half alert reader will remember that at the beginning of this this short story that uh, the character has told us that it's utterly you know first of all he's he's sort of taken the random move of going for a drive and then he's taken the utterly random you know, there's no preset journey. He's ended up here by accident. No one could have known, not even he, could have known where he'd be. So how can his parents, who state that they've gone looking for him, how can they have come across him and found him? I'm not going to give the, 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 the end as a spoiler. Just to say that by about page 20, or whenever the shiny light first appears, I pretty much guessed what that represented. I certainly knew what the parents' appearance represented by page 30 or whatever whatever it is when they appear and when the actual reveal uh, it's made explicit uh to right towards the end i you know i've got there so far ahead uh and i think that um when the reader is in front of the novelist's uh, slow steady release of a drip feed the book's in trouble it's you know as I, said, I don't want to spoil it for readers um but i felt it felt very cliched the whole mechanism of the light and the parents appearing um, you can probably figure it out even from that, but I, I just, I just thought it was sort of, you know, hackneyed really. But that's not the main failing of, of the book for me. The main failing is in the language. This guy is supposed to be a supreme stylist, and the very first words of the novel are, "I was taking, I was taking a drive. It was nice." Now, nice is not a literary word. Nice is a word where someone sort of says to you. You know, your partner says to you, oh, we've been invited to this party at my, you know, some relative. And the, the spouse doesn't really, you know, welcome that uh, revelation. You know, they don't really want to go, but they'll be obliged because it's a family do. And, and they reply, oh, that's nice. Or one of the spouses is sat watching TV, immersed in a programme, and the other spouse comes in and starts sort of telling them the news of their day. And of course, the one watching TV is just wants to hear what's going on on TV and they'll go oh that's nice nice is a word is a word that sort of shuts down it doesn't expand meaning and language and it sort of shuts down or or sort of passes it off you know so that but I'm not going to condemn a whole book style by you know the second sentence that would be ridiculous it is a sort of stream of consciousness really um now streams of consciousness the key word is stream now you want your streams of consciousness to be, you know, fast flowing, not a trickle. And in places, this is sort of uh, fast flowing, but actually most of it is rather slow trickle. And there's two, I feel, two factors that determine the pace of a stream of consciousness. The first is um, the language itself. Stream of consciousness tries to represent the way human brains work. That is, we have sort of, you know, an avalanche of thoughts. We can have thoughts crossing across other thoughts and cutting them off. We can have stray thoughts. We can have association, word associations or image associations that lead us completely astray from what we're actually focusing on. And if you want a great example of that, you can read um, Lucy Ellman's um, Ducks Nude Report, which does this for a thousand pages with just a few pauses for a subplot. And... One of the things she does is, you know, tunes are sparked in the mind of the, of the narrator. You know, songs flash into her mind. That is a much better representation of how human minds work than we get in here. Here, it's much more linear. It's much more plodding. Everything is about working out, you know, the, the immediate environment. There's, there's no real... Um, thoughts flying off from that it is absolutely locked in into the immediate sort of need to, to get out of the situation he finds it in so this is when um 
this is when the parents turn up. Maybe I only imagined they were here. Imagine that I heard my mother talking, that she said something to me. No, that's totally unthinkable. They were here all right. My mother was here. My father was here. I saw them right over there. Yes, just there, there, right there. Right over there, yes. Or maybe it was here where I am now that I at last saw my parents. Maybe they were standing right here where I am now. That's possible. It may well be that it was here. Yes, I almost think it was here. It was here. Now I'm sure of it. It was here. Nowhere else. Not there, but here. Right here. Not there, but here. Here's where. Um, I just think that's really clunky, clumsy. Writing, you know, the, the, the other aspect of stream of consciousness is repetition. Repetition of words. And when it's done well, you get, it's like poetry. It's sort of, it's rhythm and it's pulse drives you through it. And the repetition ramps it up. Here, the repetition is, it just cloying and slows everything down. I mean, that, that was, you know, the, everything was either here, there, not here, not there. It was just, I thought, really, really basic language, clumsy language, and didn't drive me through anything. It was like wading through sludge. So I was really surprised at, you know, the supreme stylist. And I know, you know, I don't know much about the septology, but I know it's sort of a meditation on art and, and all things like that, which should be right in my wheelhouse. Um, but the idea here, I thought, was hackneyed, and the writing, I just thought, was dreadful. And again, I am unwilling to blame the translator because I believe the translator's abilities uh, are not going to diminish from translating the septology to translating this. So I was shocked by this. I give it two stars. I would welcome in the comments, or if any fellow booktuber wants to make a short r rebuttal and, and, and sort of rigorously defend Fosse's writing, I do accept this is probably not the best place. This isn't a, a taster. Uh, for, you know, his more weighty work of greater gravity of the septology. I accept that. But, you know, given that it's about a, an alcoholic, and put me put me right if I'm wrong about that, plus my experience with Fosse in here, I have absolutely no desire to get to it. But as I say, you know, it's a challenge thrown out to you. If you want to put it in the comments and persuade me that, no, I should read the septology... Or if any booktubers want to make a, a short video by response, please do. And obviously post the link in your comments. Oh, no, you can't. YouTube won't let you. Well, you can reach me on Twitter. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll um, reconsider, although I won't reconsider my experience of reading this book. It's just utterly dreadful. OK, so till next time, thanks very much.